before you go to bed. You put the toothpaste on your teeth, spit out, but don't rinse. And then you put your appliance in for, for your sleep apnea. Yep. Tape your mouth. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify those two different things there before sleep, I think even for a while I was confused. I thought the sleep tape help with sleep apnea, but you explained earlier that's to help with saliva during the night. Well, it, it can help with sleep apnea. That's a whole different category. And that was how I originally got onto sleep tape because it, to me, it was a differential diagno diagnostic tool. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, once I got my sleep medicine, dental sleep medicine uh, training, uh, I really wanted to cut to the chase. And so when I asked my typical middle-aged male patient, do you snore? And the answer was always, no, I don't snore. My wife does. But, you know, and then I got the real story from the wife. It's like, oh my God, he's a, he's a, you know, and I, I could tell that there was a sleep disorder breathing issue based on other things. Dennis can see sleep apnea of decades before a physician can, because we're looking at different things. We're trained differently, but it was, it would be, it was a way to convince the patient that they had a breathing disorder. And it started off with the snoring. So if there were, I mean, in a nutshell, if the tape stays on and it's on in the morning and they slept better, that means they were forcing all the air through their nose. That helped them greatly. Uh, sympathetic tone, uh, parasympathetic tone. Obviously, it helps with oral hygiene and the oral microbiome, but that's a different category. Um, if the tape was still on, but they tossed and turned a lot, that means they couldn't, they were compliant, they could keep the tape on, but they couldn't get enough air through their nose to sleep properly. They were you know, suffering from a little hypoxia, uh, they were over-breathing CO2, et cetera. Um, and then, and if the tape comes off, obviously you can't breathe through your nose. And that is related intimately with sleep disorder breathing. So for me, it was a tool, but then later it became something that patients were like, oh my God, this is wonderful. Uh, I told, I finally convinced my husband to mouth tape, the snoring went away or they started feeling better. It's not a cure for sleep apnea. Uh, but it's a great diagnostic tool. And for borderline cases, maybe upper airway resistance syndrome, and even for people that don't have sleep apnea, it's better to secure the mouth, close it. And again, why not? There are so many benefits to breathing through your nose from the cavity and gum disease perspective and oral microbiome, but also from a sense of well-being, deeper sleep, lowering your respiratory rate. This is all measurable, by the way, uh, from an aura ring, aura ring is sensitive enough to pick up between not mouth taping and mouth taping, mouth breathing, nose breathing. But why not take advantage of that wonderful uh, wellness of being able to breathe your nose for the seven to eight hours that you're just sitting there doing nothing, right? That's what mouth taping really is. Everyone should mouth tape. Uh, I, I mouth tape, even though my mouth stays closed, I think, but I don't want to take that chance. I want to force all that air in and out so that my CO2, O2 levels are perfect and my HRV levels go up, my respiratory rate drops, my resting heart rate drops when I mouth tape. And I can breathe through my nose just fine. What I'm trying to tease out though is the difference between that appliance and the mouth tape, which you're doing both. So mouth taping, what I'm gathering here, for people that might have a bit of snoring or their breathing is slightly distorted, this might be enough for them. And you've mentioned, and I know in your book, you talk about the fact that you have mild sleep apnea. So you need this other layer, this, this actual mechanical thing that goes over your teeth and holds your jaw forward as you're sleeping as well. Exactly. And so I, I need that device. Uh, um, and as I get older, I'll probably rely more on it. Um, I've just recently lost 15 pounds. I think that helped. Uh, because your tongue can gain weight, your airway can gain weight and can become more constricted. Um, but again, as you get older, the tone of the airway is, it doesn't get any better. Um, but there are cases, borderline cases, where if you can redirect the air that goes in and out and steer it through the nose, the nose is a baffle, it slows things down. It slows down the velocity of air that goes past the airway and back out. It humidifies the air. Uh, in such a way, and so much so, that baffle, that that restriction, uh, and also changing the CO2, O2 mix so that your breathing rate drops, all of that 
makes it less likely for the airway to collapse. And once it does collapse and you're, and you're mouth breathing and, and your mouth is very dry and saliva flow is down, when those two sides of the airway stick together, they're going to stay stuck together until you break them apart with an apnea, with a sudden awakening or, or, or an arousal. And so moistening the air, slowing it down with a borderline case for someone that is just a, a, a light snore. And then when they do start snoring and the mouth falls open, the airway gets sticky uh, breathing rate is higher, respiratory rate is higher. Uh, there are cases where that is the cure. Now, I'm not asking patients to to be to be determining that on their own. Get a sleep study, get an aura ring, uh, track your sleep, and if your sleep partner says you're snoring, deal with it right away. It's not funny. It's not cute. It is a sign of um, of of a narrowing airway. And uh, there's actually a great product out of Toronto. I think it's Toronto. Yes, it is Toronto called Nora, N-O-R-A. And I'm going to put them on my store soon. Haven't gotten around to it yet, but it's a device that I tried and I took out my oral appliance and it's a little air bladder. All the devices are far away by a plug, six feet away from the bed. There's just a plastic tube and a little microphone by the bed. And when it hears you snore, it fills up the air bladder that's in, inserted into your pillow and it changes the positioning of your head. Um, and that's enough where instead of going into a full apnea or staying in a state where you're, you're having long apneas, in other words, you're not breathing for 30, 45, 50 seconds, this readjusts you quickly and, and subtly. Um, and for certain patients, this, this is wonderful. It really works well. Um, and so that's a device that I'm going to be recommending soon. And that is available in Canada, by the way, uh, all of North America. I think it's available all over. Um, but so it's, it's, I know where, what you're trying to do and everyone's looking for that absolute, like, should I tape? Should I do this? And again, it's multifactorial. Find someone on your team. I would argue that it should be a dentist, a sleep trained dentist. Physicians are a little obtuse on this, uh, based on their training. No offense. Um, um, and we can see it sooner so we can treat it earlier so that you don't gain all the weight and get all the comorbidities of sleep apnea that come over time with, uh, you know, not breathing properly, suffering from sleep disorder breathing and having an AHI of 5, 10, 15, 74 interruptions per minute of waking up and suffering and brain fog and all of that, brain damage. Um Get someone in you on your team that can address this in its early stages, and talk about things like Nora or mouth taping. And and uh, again, if you're not sleeping well, you're going to wake up with this huge appetite. Your leptin and ghrelin hormones are affected. Uh, these are the same hormones that they're playing with with these uh, weight loss medications. Um, and um, you're gonna you're gonna gain weight. And you're going to look for energy because you're tired, the brain fog, and very fermentable carbohydrates, uh, junk food, breads, crackers, snacks, sugar, uh, sweetened beverages, all of that. So don't start down that road. Um, I wish I had caught my sleep apnea earlier. I talk about that in the book, uh, but I didn't know. The other device- and Most of us don't know. I saw on your website was this suction cup for your tongue. Yes, how does that compare to the, I've seen your device in a video that actually goes over the teeth and holds the bottom jaw out. Yep. Is the suction cup of the tongue, does that do something similar? Obviously it's a different mechanical way of holding things, but does it have a similar end result? That's a great question. Um, the quick answer is no, but uh, that's called the TRD, the tongue retention device. And I like those. I, I would have them stocked in my office the one I chose to stock was out of Canada, actually. It came in two different sizes. And so what my device does, it's rigid. It has these McPherson strut rigid uh, devices. They're telescopic things that I can move my chin forward. I can stretch open. But when I go to relax, when I let go of the chin, you know, the jaw will fall back, especially... As you go into deep sleep, the muscles relax. Um, the struts, you know, bind or bang into each other. I mean, they're they're fixed in length. They're adjustable side to side and in telescopic length. And that 
prevents the jaw from falling back. If the jaw doesn't fall back, then the tongue is in a forward position. When you go into deep sleep, the tongue will roll up into a little ball. It's very complicated. Many people have different tone and different positioning of the tongue. They have different muscle memory. This, this is all the mild functional aspect of things. And the tongue can gain weight as well. It can marbleize and fat. It can get bigger. It can block the airway. But by holding the jaw forward, and this is not for everyone. Uh, again, I would screen my patients by sending them to an ENT, sending a camera down their throat, doing a modified Mueller's maneuver that's in the book. And I would want to see the difference based on the camera and the ENT. I actually had to train them to do this. It's, it's a Mueller's maneuver, which is what they do, but then it's modified for the sake of a dentist. So they would look at the, the airway, but then I would want to see the airway with the, the chin supported and the chin all the way back. I would want those two extremes compared, and he would give me a percentage in the three different zones, nasolaryngeal, pharynx. and where, So knowing where the blockage is and how much of a difference there is between being fully protruded and fully retruded gave me a sense that I, would, I was always working on the right patient, case selection. And 99% of the time, it worked. If you don't do that kind of pre-selection, then it may only work 66% of the time. These are numbers that you see in studies. So, so uh, it's not for everyone. And there are some side effects sometimes. But the TRD is a great way to get the tongue out of the way. The jaw can still fall back. But when you place this, it's got a soft silicone flange that sits between the lips and the teeth. So it's held in place. It's like a shield. There's, a, there's an airway through it. You can still breathe through it if you want. And then there's a, a bulb that goes inside the mouth with an opening in it. And if you force your tongue in there and push out all the air, it's a suction cup, and then your tongue is caught in this forward position. Ideally, it should be up on the roof of your mouth. But for those people where the tongue curls up and balls up and goes to the back of the nasopharynx or lower velopharynx, then then that's a good thing. That could also make a difference. And it's cheap. I mean, they cost nothing. You can get them on Amazon, I think, for 30 bucks. Um, I mean, I would always do it in conjunction with a provider, but if you're willing to try it, and then make sure you're tracking that. Uh, there are simple apps that just listen to your snoring. Does it affect your snoring? If the snoring goes away with a TRD, you have accomplished something. You're less likely to have apneas. Again, verify that with a sleep study. An aura ring is a great way to measure sleep. You're going to get more deep sleep. Typically, people will drop into deep sleep, but then the aura ring will show you this in a graph. How long is that bottom blue bar? In other words, you want it to be as wide as possible, up to a point, because the body will get you out of there naturally, out of that deep sleep. But if it's just a little blip, and then you bounce out of it, and then you bounce back into it, those are all apneas. You're, you're trying to get into deep sleep, but once you're in deep sleep, these muscles and REM different type of deep sleep, all these muscles let go and then you can't breathe and you're, uh, and then you wake up and that's an apnea. So you can see all this represented. It's a, it's like a stage play. It's like a Broadway show. There's certain things you need to see in terms of timing and all that. Uh, and by the way, the, the biggest, just want to throw this in there, something I've learned over time. I talked about it in the book, but I didn't really emphasize it as much as I wish I had. Probably the most important thing, other than getting a sleep study and verifying your ability to breathe through your airway, nose breathing, mouth breathing, all of that, that's, those are the, that's the anatomical portion of a puzzle piece in sleep apnea. But in terms of lifestyle and hacks and sleep hacks, the biggest one by far is going to bed within minutes of the same time every night and waking up. I would wake up naturally, but what will happen is that if you go to bed within the same minute, I mean, set an alarm to go to bed and make sure you're in bed. We try for 945, and we're pretty good on that. And I typically wake up wide awake to where I can't go back to sleep within minutes of the same time. That's without an alarm clock. It could be still be dark. Right now, it's because of daylight savings, it's very dark. And that is your body. That's your circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm is quite strong if you let it be that way. But if you don't go to bed and you've been blinded by blue light and you go to bed late, you're not going to be able to catch up on any sleep because you've missed that first stage of deep sleep and even REM later. But it's staging. It's all about staging. So that is the biggest sleep hack, I think. Going to bed within minutes of the same time every single night. And if you do make a change, 
make it slowly over a period of two to six weeks. And again, that's why everyone gets crazy during daylight savings time. I mean, car accident rates go up, uh, death rates, industrial accidents, all of that. People get tired. That one hour makes a huge difference. It's big. Even 10 minutes makes a difference. You've brought up Aura Ring a few times, and you brought up a sleep study. I'm a big fan of Aura Ring as well. Is that technology now at a place where it replaces an actual sleep study going in and getting all the wires hooked up and going through the whole rigmarole, or is it is there still more benefit you can get from doing a full-on sleep study? That's a really important question to, to have an answer to. And I love the Aura Ring. I'm not associated with them in any way. Um, um, and I'm on my third version, um, and the software is getting better. The algorithm is getting better. It's a great company. Uh, they take it very seriously. They have studies that compare their study, essentially that's what it is. It's a sleep study every night on your ring that they're doing. Um, and they compare their study to a PSG, which is the gold standard, the polysomnography, which is where you go into an office, a like a clinic. It's not a hospital, typically. And they observe you. And they do, as you said, hook you up to a wiring harness from your chest to your feet to... Um, you know, brainwave patterns, your head, scalp, and then they measure you. Um, and they do get a lot of data from that. And the data that Aura Ring is not getting are the brainwave patterns. And so Aura Ring claims that they're within 97% of a PSG. I would argue that that 3% that they haven't matched is probably some very important data, brainwave patterns. And, um, Maybe they're working on that. Uh, I don't. I love their product and I recommend it to everyone. But if you've never had a PSG, let, let's say if your sleep scores are 95 and higher and your readiness scores are excellent and all that, you probably have nothing to worry about. And if you're not snoring and you've verified that, your mouth taping, you're healthy overall. If you feel like taking a nap during the day, that's not normal. I'm 65 years old. I don't nap anymore. I used to nap a lot. Because it was there, and I would just give in to it, and I would nap for 10 minutes. Uh, I napped on the side of a glacier, locked in with crampons and an ice axe on Mount Shasta, because I was tired. And I napped for 10, 12 minutes, felt great, and kept climbing. I mean, that was my norm. And I was healthy. I was climbing mountains and skiing and mountain biking and you know, doing eight-night, eight-day traverses above treeline in the Sierras in the middle of the winter. I mean, these are all very demanding things, but I was always tired, sleepy tired. That's gone. Uh, going from 12 apneas per minute, which is considered to be mild, um, mild, moderate, and severe, to zero apneas uh, based on many PSGs. And I had a lot of them because I helped develop a product that was later bought by Google um, and worked on their algorithm. Uh, it was a new way of measuring sleep, touchless. Um, and so we were comparing that technology to PSG. So I was being wired up a lot. So I've had a lot of, of these attended sleep studies. Um, and um, it, it's still an important study to get. You can still garner a lot of data from it. And Again, Aura Ring is great. It's something that you should be looking at every night, every morning. My wife and I compare results. You know, we say, hi, honey, you know, good morning. How'd you sleep? And uh, we'll compare scores. And that's kind of our morning routine uh, in the very, and if someone didn't sleep well, 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 did I snore last night? Did I keep you up and vice versa? And was the temperature wrong? Are we using the wrong comforters for the season? You know, all those things. That This is important. And did we go to bed too late? Uh, you know, when we're streaming TV and that time comes and we're in the middle of a show, we're good. It goes off and we go upstairs, we turn on our red lights, brush our teeth, and we go to bed. This is probably the most important health modification, behaviorally speaking, that we have made in our lives. And we were both very healthy to begin with, uh, but evidently not as healthy as we thought. And this really took it up a, a bunch of notches. So I would say... I would, and again, I say this in the book, and I know it's a little unrealistic, but I put it in there just to be a, a radical and get the ball moving. And I think they do this in Iceland and Italy. I spoke to someone in Iceland. Everyone should get a sleep study at a young age. Get a baseline and 
I treated a lot of, I treat a lot of infants for sleep. We can catch it way back then. Physicians aren't doing that, of course, even pediatric, uh, maybe a pediatric ENT with a lot of good continuing education is catching it, but they're not getting the referral from the general. It has to pass, it, uh, it has to go from a dentist or a general physician to get to that person. So there's a, there's that threshold or that, that, uh, kind of firewall, uh, which is not good. Um, but everyone should have a sleep study at some point in time. If you haven't had one, get one. The problem is, is getting one and getting your insurance to pay for it. Because if you're not sick and you're thin and you don't complain about napping and, and all that, and you read the book, you read it twice. And you know that in my book, I said, here's the Epworth test they're going to give you. It's a written test. Just fail it. This is how you fail it. Get a 11 or higher on it and tell them you fall asleep at the wheel when you're picking up the grandkids or the kids. Get that PSG. And again, they're, they're incentivizing managed care, uh, medical care, to not do that test. It, it costs a lot of money. Um, I actually set up a system in, in my area, in the Silicon Valley, um, where if patients didn't have insurance, I had a way, first of all, I had a way of porting that patient directly to the sleep study. I bypassed the primary care physician. I did it legally. And I worked with the owner of the clinic who was a very, uh, Dartmouth trained sleep physician. And he listened to what my issue was. I, I was seeing a lot of sleep apnea, but they were always getting bounced back. And then 10 years later, they would be like, I have sleep apnea and the physician recognizes it. And, but it was too late. I mean, not too late. It's never too late, but, but it was it, uh, unnecessarily late, uh, cause they were suffering at that point. They had gained weight or had a fib or something, but, um, uh, and we worked out a system where I wouldn't, I would fill out the form that he would fill out, give to the insurance plan, but I wouldn't sign it. I would give it to him. He trusted me enough. And, you know, uh, um, after, two to six months, you realize that I was batting like 970, 980. And I'm convinced those other cases were so borderline that they were hard to pick up. Um, and we kept after him, but, um, and then they would get the sleep study insurance would pay for it. And again, that was the only way they could get it. Cause these were healthy individuals. They were like me, they were thin and healthy and, um, or kids. They really push back on kids because they think they're just going to grow out of it. Um, so that worked well, but then, I negotiated a cash price. It was down to 1100. So normally insurance companies pay about between three and $5,000 for that sleep attended study, the sleep, the attended sleep study. Uh, I got them down to a cash price of 1100. So for those people that didn't have insurance, they could, they could get that sleep study. So sleep studies are important still to answer your question. I think everyone should check in every decade if they're healthy obviously more frequently than that. In other words, if your dentist is making that device for you and he thinks he's done, go get tested again and verify that that device is working. If you're mouth taping and you think you're better and that your sleep apnea is cured, which is doubtful, uh, depending on what level of uh, sleep apnea you have, verify that. Don't rely on the aura ring. Look at those brainwave patterns, get a PSG, get some good data. It's important. Got it. We'll end on this. So you get your sleep study done Everybody ideally should be taping their mouth. There's different benefits they're going to get, whether or not they have sleep issues. And then we've talked about the one that holds the mandible forward, the device that you use, the one that suctions the tongue. The, the common one is the CPAP machine, which uses air. Right. Is there any other devices people are using if they have sleep apnea? The, the Nora device. Um, I, I, if you have a full-on uh, diagnosis of sleep apnea, I wouldn't, you, you could still use it along with other aids. Um, there's a lot of hybrid approaches, uh, or, or combination approaches like some, uh, what worked well for me are, uh, I had a patient who had a AHI of 74, little old lady, delightful, great sense of humor, dead tired, right? Had lots of heart disease issues. She was in her seventies. She had an AHI of 74. That's 74. That's more than I mean, 74 times a, a, a minute, she was waking up. Imagine someone waking you up that often. She was, wasn't getting any sleep. The doctors gave up on her. She couldn't wear her CPAP. CPAP, there's no CPAP that would actually fix that. You'd have to blow her up like a balloon to, re to prevent those apneas. So, so uh, I, she wanted, her, her son was the CEO and he 
healthy guy had mild sleep apnea and he said, Oh, you got to, my mom's going to come in to see you. You can cure her. And, and, and I, I couldn't, but I made a deal with her and I had her sign the chart. I said, listen, if I can get you down with an oral appliance, it won't fix you completely. It won't get you to zero or below five because you're just too far along and your airway is just too narrow. Um, then, uh, will you try the CPAP again? And actually I told her about an APAP, which is a more modern, has better feedback, is better than a CPAP. And she says, sure, I'll do it. So it took us about three months. I made her the device, titrated it, adjusted it. And I said, listen, uh, it's time for a sleep study. This is the best I can do. Uh, and she was protruded. She was able to wear it and put it in. And, you know, it requires a lot of patient management and help and all that. But she did really, really well. She was very motivated. Um, and so she did the sleep study. We got it down to 19 apneas, which is a complete failure in dental sleep medicine. It should be five or less. Uh, but we got her down to 19. And then I said, listen, 19 is pretty good. I, in fact, I'm surprised. I was hoping for mid-20s. Now it's time to try the APAP. So we got her the APAP. I directed her to a different uh, CPAP uh, provider. These are the sleep technicians. There's some that just throw it at you and say, you're on your own. But there's some that are really work with the people. And she got onto the APAP. And now she has a, a an apnea with the two together. She has to wear the oral appliance. But the APAP is working for several reasons. One is that the airway is already open. So the pressure is way lower. Again, an APAP or a CPAP blows you up like a balloon. It pushes pushes air past the constricting airway. With the positive pressure, it balloons up your airway and keeps that pressure, assuming your mouth is closed. You have to mouth tape sometimes with an APAP and CPAP. That's a different story. And that positive pressure keeps the airway open and you can sleep better. So the two together, again, every person's different. But So there are many different therapies. The, a CPAP alone has very low compliance. After one year, only 30% of people can stay on the CPAP. And typically those pe people are forgotten by the medical system. They're like, oh, we've done everything we can. You've got to wear it. And the patient doesn't wear it. And then they go in next year for another test. And have you been wearing it? I've tried. You know, they haven't. If you're a pilot in Europe or a heavy machinery operator, your CPAP is wirelessly sending information to your provider, making sure that you're wearing it. It's like a breathalyzer, right? It's verifying that that you're doing that. And I think that's great. The pilots union here in the U S has not allowed that they're against that. Uh, CPAPs are not comfortable. Uh, they have a lot of side effects. They're blowing a lot of air in you. People that wear CPAPs have a higher decay rate. It's a lot of dry air in there. The humidifier may not work. Uh, it's uncomfortable. It leaves marks on your face. It prevents you from moving around, although you shouldn't be moving around if you're in deep sleep. So, so that is again, something that was developed in the sixties. I think it was here, here at Stanford, and uh, it's not perfect. So, but there are a lot of things. There's a lot of hybrid options that if you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and the person, whether it's a dentist, medical, uh, a dentist, physician team working together, that can be fixed. And again, every person's different, but it's something you really need to fix. It is life changing uh, if you can get deep sleep and REM and sleep well. You're a different person, and your your destiny, your whole life. It'll be two different paths, remarkably different from, from each other if you are getting good, deep, restorative sleep. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. Most acidic drinks like kombucha and a lot of mineral waters, Perrier, for example, they're pretty low. Coffee, wine, iced tea, my favorite. Those start off at a low pH. And if you're drinking a lot of that,